lot uh, to the first lecture series that CBC has had in quite a while, and we're trying to get that back on track to be a, a regularly occurring event. Um, this has been kind of my uh, uh, labor of love for the last three months with a, a couple of the other faculty members up here getting this particular one going. And I'd like to thank CBC for hosting it and allowing this to happen, and also the Beadville Rotary Club. Uh, I just found out today and has made a generous donation to pay for this whole thing. So if you know a Rotary member, please thank them for, for that. Uh, as you know, the topic is J. Frank Doby, who uh, personally for me, uh, I have a history degree and I attribute my interest in Texas history specifically to Doby. I, I grew up reading uh, I'll Tell You a Tell and some of his books about tall tales in, in Texas. And that kind of drove my interest into history and even further into folklore, uh, which as many of you know, he, he kind of brought folklore into the academic arena uh, as a discipline, whereas prior it was just kind of a, a traditional, it was folklore, it wasn't really a discipline yet. So. Uh, our speakers for tonight are uh, Mary Margaret Campbell, the director of George West Story Fest and Doby D. Chose, which has to, to really do with all things Doby and Stephen Davis, uh, curator of the Whitless Collection at Texas State University, and also an uh, Adobe biographer. Uh, his book, A Liberated Mind, is a very well done book on Adobe, and I highly recommend it, and it, it pretty much describes Adobe to the T, I think. So I will uh, turn it over to Ms. Campbell. situated here so I don't dump the water over. That would be good. First of all, I would like to thank Taylor for inviting me to uh, speak with you tonight. I really appreciate that and to Coastal Bay College for having the series and to the Rotary Club for funding the series. Um, as, as Taylor said, I am the uh, executive director of George West Story Fest, and we're 29 days away from festival, so my mind is a little frazzled right now, so um, I'm going to probably do more reading than speaking this evening, but uh, I figured it would, it would come out a lot more clearly if I did it this way than if I just tried to talk to you. So, um, so here goes. I grew up on a ranch in southern Lago County. Being raised on a ranch, I learned to drive at a very young age. By the time I was 13, my dad was sending me from the ranch to Lagardo on FM 3162, the curvy road that connects Highway 281 and Farm Road 534. On my route was a historical marker. One summer day, I decided to stop and read it. It was about a man I'd never heard of, so I got back in the car and drove home. Subsequently, when friends would be with me and ask about the marker, I would say, oh, some famous guy was born out there. When I was in graduate school, I presented a paper at the Texas and Southwestern Popular Culture Association Conference. And while at the conference, I was telling one of my Texas Tech professors about some, uh, Ken Davis, about some other ideas I had for papers. And he said, you know, those ideas are better suited for the Folklore Society, the Texas Folklore Society, than popular culture. So I joined the Texas Folklore Society and I'm still a member. And I've even served as the society's president a few years ago. But at the time I joined, little did I know that that famous guy had been instrumental in resurrecting the society after the war and going on to be a secretary editor for over two decades. As it turns out, that famous guy and I had a couple of things in common, in addition to growing up in South, South Lago County. Well, after Dr. Davis suggested I join TFS, I started reading some Doby pieces here and there and began to realize his influence. When I was in grad school and home on holiday, visiting my grandmother, uh, Nani Grimsinger, I asked if my late grandfather, F.X. Doherty, had known Doby. And she kind of rolled her eyes and she said, hmm, yeah, we met him one time. Your grandfather and I and Roy and Hattie Hennett attended a barbecue where he was the guest speaker. On the way home, all your grandfather and Roy kept talking about was what a blowhard he was. But he didn't even know what he was talking about. So I got a different perspective from my revered grandmother. Needless to say, I had some mixed feelings about Dobie after that. 
But I kept reading his works and learning more about his contributions to the preservation of folklore, eventually studying him more and more. But this man died in 1964. That's 51 years ago. Yet here we are at a lecture dedicated to him. This morning, I thought, I'm just going to Google search J. Frank Dobie and see what happens. In 0 0.66 seconds, it yielded 246,000 results. I didn't read them all. I just wanted to see what it was. <laughs> Even the current issue of the Texas Co-op Power Magazine features an article on J. Frank Dobie, and it's by historian Lon Taylor. It's a really interesting article, and I've mentioned it a couple of times in, in the paper. But who was J. Frank Toby, and why is there so much interest in him still? Well, he's Live Oak County's most famous son, and I'm from Live Oak County. He was born and raised on the Dobie Ranch in the southern part of the county. But he decided he wanted to go off to college, and he studied classical literature. This ranch boy studied classical literature. But it was when he was foreman of his uncle, uncle's ranch in LaSalle County that he learned his life's calling while listening to an old vaquero named Santos Cortez tell stories around the campfire. Dobie said, quote, I seem to be seeing a great painting of something I've known all of my life. I seem to be listening to a great epic of something that had been commonplace in my youth, but which now took on new meaning. It was then that Dobie realized the value of the oral tradition of stories passed down from generation to generation, that stories reflect the lives of the people who came before us. In his current article, Lon Taylor says, Dobie's focus on oral tradition stemmed from the conviction that the narratives of old timers had a value in themselves and did not need to be adapted into fiction or poetry to have communicative power. So Dobie started making a concerted effort to find those stories and the tellers of those stories. He had always been, had an ear for the rhythm and cadence of language, thus his interest in the poetry of Keats and Shelley and Byron. Hart Stilwell said of Dobie, when Dobie listened, he heard the music and the beauty. He could get the real flavor of the person telling the story in his writing of the story. Lon Taylor also comments on Dobie, saying that Dobie had an ability to get people to talk, a sharp ear for, again, cadence, and language, and an uncanny ability to create a stage for his narrator. Most of his 20 books are in fact strings of finely crafted anecdotes derived from interviews with stove up cowboys, prospectors, and desert rats. Although Dobie was secretary editor for the Texas Folklore Society for more than two decades, he did not consider himself a folklorist, but a chronicler of what had been, life had been like in the past. He did not collect the stories, the lore, to analyze the stories, or to per but to preserve them and to present them and to present the value of the stories. In, January, in his January 28, 2015 column in the Corpus Christi Caller Times, Murphy Gibbons notes that no other writer captured the sense of this place, South Texas, like Dobie, and that of all famous Texas writers, Dobie came closest to the skin of the people. The brush country of Live Oak County and the ranch people of South Texas became part of his DNA, part of his identity as a writer. Like many other, others who have written about Dobie, Gibbons observes that Dobie's books and articles were all written in his unique storytelling style. Dobie himself, himself once said that he considered himself quote, something of an artist, a conscious craftsman. I tried to write well, he said. My idea of life is not to win an argument, an election. It's producing something useful and interesting. And he said, my custom is to try to tell a tale as the original, original teller should have told it. And any tale belongs to whoever can best tell it. As we said, as I said, Dobie grew up on the family ranch in Southern Lilo County. And that ranch, the land, the people, the wildlife, influenced him maybe more strongly than even he realized. He tried to get away from it. One writer even said he broke from the land by going off to college and taking jobs elsewhere. But it was too deeply ingrained in him for the land to break from Dobie. 
This influence is obvious in many ways, in the manner of his dress, his affirmation that agarita jelly is the very best in the world, his adopting the Paisano as his symbol, and a myriad of others. He even secured the, one of the mesquite beams from the old um, courthouse in Oakville and had it turned into a metal piece that he used in his uh, home, the Paisano. His autobiography, Some Part of Myself, tells of his early life on the ranch. I particularly like this work of Dobie's because my family ranched a couple of ranches over from Dobie and I read about what life was like for my family at that particular time in uh, history too, so it kind of interesting to me. Rocky Reagan, local Rocky Reagan, said of Dobie in his piece, we came from the same range, that Frank had it, cowboy life, in his blood, but was too smart to fight the game and chose the wiser course of recording in his own rare style for future generations, those unusual legends. He further said that Dobie is, quote, bone and sinew a frontiersman, a rare character, and I'm proud to say a friend of mine. In a portrait of Poncho, William Bode observed that Dobie had strong sentiments about the ranch country, but he was not sentimental about it. He knew what he was, an interpreter of the land, and more importantly, its people. Frank Dobie was realistic about his ranch-related abilities, however. Regarding hunting, he said, it's a part of myself, to speak of my shooting career is to laugh. Sometimes I can hit a barn door, and sometimes I cannot. He admitted he wasn't good at riding and roping. This reminds me of Elmer Kelton and Charles Russell. Like Dobie, Elmer Kelton was ranch raised, but left the ranch and became a journalist and novelist. His novels accurately depict ranch life and ranch people. Painter Charles Russell, although he was not ranch raised, went west as a young man to learn and tried to learn the cowboy way of life by working on ranches in Montana. Like Dobie, both Kelton and, and Russell admitted they weren't that great at being a cowboy, but all three men used their artistic talents to bring that way of life and appreciation for that way of life to others through their art. And yes, Dobie's works are art. When J. Frank Dobie was sent to school in Alice to live with his grandmother to attend high school in 1904, he never returned to live full-time on the ranch. In 1906, his family moved to Beeville. In some part of myself, he says, quote, that fall I left for college, never to reside again in the region. Nevertheless, for years after I left, I spent summers on the ranch and have never ceased returning to it with eagerness. It has been a place where I belonged both in imagination and in reality, a place on which I felt free in, a, in the way that, no, that one can feel free only on its own piece of earth. It has said more to me than any person I have known or any writer I have read, though only through association with fine minds and spirits have I come to realize its sayings. In uh, 2004, I had the uh, nice opportunity to visit with Mr. Bob Gale of Beeville about um, Dobie J. Frank Dobie. And he said that at Christmas time, when he was a little boy, uh, Frank Dobie and Bertha would stay with the Gale family because they had an extra room and Dobie's mother's house was full of family. So at night, uh, J. Frank Dobie would smoke his pipe by the fireplace and tell stories. And Mr. Gale, would, as I said, was a kid at the time and didn't realize he was a real writer. Um, Dobie would, would tell a story every night when he would come in from across the street. Mr. Gale said that he enjoyed J. F. Dobie, J. J. Frank Dobie as a person, but didn't agree with him politically. He was fun to be around and to listen to. But Mr. Gale said he really knew uh, Dobie's mother better because she would invite him in for cookies and cake. Not long before Dobie's father, Jonathan Richard Dobie, died, he sold 3,000 acres of the, of the ranch to an adjoining landowner. Mrs. Dobie kept the remainder of the ranch until her death in 1948, at which time uh, Frank Dobie and his, his uh, siblings inherited it. They eventually sold it to Ralph Jackson and his associates, and today the ranch is still in the Jimmy Jackson family of Vigo, and Mr. Jackson is here. I believe Dr. Chin lives in the house that was the Dobie house, is that correct? Okay, I thought so. J. Frank Dobie, as we all know, was a lover of books. He had a vast collection. 
personal collection. Um, on one occasion, I had a, a chance to speak with former Live Oak County librarian Opal Miller, who told me that when Live Oak County had its centennial celebration in the 50s, that uh, Dobie was approached to um, donate financially to the centennial cause. He declined, saying he would rather donate to the library than to a festival. So he didn't do it. Um, but prior to his death, he did establish the J. Frank Doby Library Trust, which annually awards financial support for purchasing books to Texas public libraries serving populations of 20,000 or less and open at least 20 uh, hours per week, among some other criteria. And in recent years, Lago County uh, Library has been able to uh, secure one of those grants from the trust. Um, but the funds can only be awarded for the sole use of purchasing books. No equipment, stuff like that. Lon Tinkle said of Doby in a writer loyal to real experience. Posterity will, I believe, take him much more seriously than he has been taken in his lifetime. If we, it will keep his books alive as long as any written by Texans or about Texas since Cabeza de Vaca's Relacion in 1542. Not alive just as history or folklore, but as the work of a unique artist, bearing witness to reality. So long as story patterns convey meanings as they have since the dawn of literature, in a way unlike that of other forms of expressing truth, Doby will remain one of the few Texas immortals. Frank H. Wardlaw of the UT Press said, it is impossible to estimate what Frank Doby has meant to the literature and to the writers of the Southwest. In the early 2000s, a group formed in Live Oak County called the J. Frank Doby Society of Live Oak County, and two of its former members are in the audience. The mission of the Doby Society was to develop an appreciation of the lifetimes and contributions to literature of the Southwest of J. Frank Doby that will benefit students, historians, and folklorists. The society was active for two or three years. We met monthly. Um, a a spin-off Doby reading group formed as well. We took a few trips. One memorable one included going to Austin, and we toured uh, Dog McDoby's Austin home, which is now the Missioner Center for Writers, and a Spartan Creek place outside of Austin called Paisana, which is now a writer's retreat. We also um, made sure that <laughs> the historical marker that uh, is dedicated to him stays in one place because it was out, you know, where that guy was born out there, um, but it kept being stolen. So while we were we were a group, um, we had it. We rewrote the text. Right, Roberta, we rewrote the text. You did. I don't. Okay, well, okay. I tried to. We did, and uh, submitted it. Got a new marker in and placed it on the courthouse lawn in George West. That way, it, it stays put. And what's out there on Farm Road 3162 is a little marker about that big, Oops, sorry, <laughs> about that big, it just says, hey, the, big, the main one's in town. Um, but we had a, a really cool unveiling ceremony and all that stuff. Um, and while another thing that we did as, as uh, the Dover Society was we asked uh, the executive director at the time, Becky Allen of StoryFest, if we could have some time during the festival to uh, tell some Dobie stories. And she agreed, and we did that in 2003 and 2004. Um, we had local people uh, tell Dobie stories. We also had um, Richard Dobie from Crystal City come and tell the story of the Mescala Man. And he brought a paper mache little man, and it had the little gold pieces. It was really pretty cool. Um, but eventually, the society uh, disbanded. Um, <clears throat> and after that, one reason or another, I became the director of George West Story Fest. And in 2010, I invited playwright and author William Jack Bill Sibley to be an MC at Story Fest. Afterward, I asked him what he thought about Story Fest, and he said, This is a great festival, but I'm afraid you're missing out on an important Live Oak County legacy. You should be honoring J. Frank Doby in some way. And I explained about the society and how we've done the Doby time and all, all of that. But Bill's vision was building a campfire on the courthouse lawn and having people sit around and tell stories from Dobie's works. And I'm thinking of the festival planner and me was going, oh my God, I don't think we can do that to the lawn. And you know, Anyway, but I thought, but we need to do something. 
So the next summer, as I was trying to find lodging for the storyteller performers for that year, I discovered there were no rooms at the end, so to speak. It was right when the Eagleford Shale had just taken over this part of the world, and there were no rooms, any motels in Lubbock County to be had. And I just panicked. What am I going to do? Am I going to farm these people out to local houses? What am I going to do? And I remembered that my um, my mother-in-law had recently told me about a place in Oakville that had hosted the Brush Country Cattle Women. And it was at that little jail out there. So I thought, okay, I gotta go out there and check it out. And so I went, um, a couple from San Antonio named Albert and Mari Davila had bought the place, they bought the whole block, so to speak, and they had uh, restored the jail, turned it into a lodge, and then they had purchased and had donated to them little houses from area ranches and placed them around the perimeter of this of this uh, city block, all facing inward. And when I went out there that day, Albert just happened to be there. And I told him my dilemma, and he said, you want to look around? I said, sure. He took me into every little house out there. Oh, they are amazing. Each house has its own decor. They have, if they're all period correct, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And so he said, um, well, would you like to use any of these for your storytellers? And I said, take the whole thing. <laughs> he said, really? I would. So he did. He agreed. So we set up a deal. This was in 2010, 11, 2011. Um, so I'm driving back to George West that afternoon and I'm, I'm thinking about this place and these grounds are just phenomenal. That whole hanging tree is there. And, and I thought, hey, this is where we can have that thing Bill was wanting to do. And so I called him, told him about it. And we met soon after that, and Dobie D. Joe's Campfires, Chili Con Carne, in the words of J. Frank Dobie, was born. We decided that we would invite authors to read from the works of Dobie and storytellers to tell stories from the works of Dobie and provide a meal of chili and pump and combo. I convinced my husband Cody to cook the chili and our friend Rodney Nance to cook the pump and combo to keep it. Even, even to keep the event rustic and laid back, we determined it would be a BYOLC affair. Bring your own lawn chair. We limited the tickets to 150, partly out of consideration for our two volunteer cooks, and partly because we wanted to keep the experience intimate and quaint. Over the course of the past four years, we have had a stellar lineup of authors and storytellers. Stephen Davis, for example, who will be speaking to you in a few moments, um, was with us in 2012. Um, we've also had Don Graham, who teaches Dobie's Life and Literature of the Southwest at UT, Joe Nick Potosky from Texas Monthly, historian and author W.C. Jameson, and the list goes on and on. Now this year, on Friday, November 6th, we will be presenting the fifth annual Dobie D. Joe. We weren't sure we'd get one off the ground. We're at five, we're excited. Um, this year's lineup includes the current president of the Texas Institute of Letters, Andres Tiarina, Texas poet laureate Carmen Tejoya, author and historian Mike Cox, author of the recently published book on the West Brothers, Bruce Shackelford, author and storyteller Mary Law Crofts, and storytellers Lanny Jo Burnett and Lee Hale. The event has grown in reputation. In 2013, we sold out of those 150 tickets and people got quite irritated that they couldn't get a ticket. So last year, we decided to offer a performance only ticket because I can tell you, Cody Campbell's not cooking any more chili than 100 pounds of chili meat. And I wouldn't ask Rodney to make any more comic couple than he already does. So, so now we offer both. You can get a meal, the, the regular meal and, and uh, performance or just a performance tickets. The, the meal tickets are only sold pre-sale, but the performance you can get there at the, okay, at the event. So why don't we continue to talk about J. Frank Dobie? Because he helped preserve, preserve the folklore, the stories of Texas and the Southwest. He helped Texans realize we have an oral history that we need to preserve and relish and pass along to the future generations. He helped us to realize that what we take for granted in our daily lives not only has merit and importance, but it also has beauty. As Harry Ransom said of Dobie, quote, it will take a long time to discover 
and rediscover him. I'm going to close with um, something, if I can find it here. I'm kind of a, a closet poet, and um, I recently saw a call for submissions for a persona poem about somebody from the Southwest who had made an important mark. So with a persona poem, the, the writer assumes the persona of the character. So here's my little attempt, and it's called a Storyteller of the Southwest. The soil, the brasada, the stamping of horses' hooves in morning's first light, the paisana, sanisa, lowing of cattle in the brush, these are part of me. But I left them for the world of Keats, Wordsworth, Shelley, for the cadence, rhythm of words found in books, until an old Bokhetto's words made me see the beauty of the world I'd left behind. Longing to share that beauty, I chronicled stories of the land and its people. I listened, wrote, taught, took South Texas and the, South and the Southwest into the world, awakened its natives to appreciate and admire their own heritage lore. I may have broken from the land, but the land did not break from me. Thank you. sound recording. I'm going to try to play it. Hopefully that'll work. Thanks, Mary Margaret. That was terrific. everything, so I have my backup notes here. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here at Coastal Bend Community College. It's a beautiful campus and a really nice uh, chance to walk around before I came here to the auditorium. I want to thank Taylor Tomlin for putting this together, inviting Mary Margaret and myself. It's a real honor to come here to the heart of Doby country and talk about J. Frank Doby. And um, I can't really add a whole lot to what Mary Margaret said, but I'm gonna try a little bit. And uh, you know, you raised so many interesting points and hopefully some of these slides and some of the things I talk about will help elaborate a little bit more on who this guy was because we do have some folks in the audience who actually did get to know Doby during their lifetime. Um, or during his lifetime, and of course they were pretty young. Uh, so for us to get a real sense of who J. Frank Doby is, you know, you can go back to his books. You can also go to his uh, papers, his archives, which I've done, and uh, you find all kinds of surprises when you start digging into somebody's personal mail and, and things like that. So I was able to use a lot of that to put together this sort of portrait of Doby um, that I put into this biography. So I think um, one of the, Dobie has um, so many uh, enduring, uh, lasting effects on Texas culture that uh, most of them we take for granted. I'm gonna talk about a, a few of those here today. Um, but you know, you mentioned writers like uh, Elmer Kelton, who was, who was not a good cowboy. Of course, Larry McMurtry was the same way. And, and both of them were so strongly influenced by Dobie. And, and the works that, that he put together, um, and, and one of the ways, and one of the ways I focus on in my biography of Toby uh, that he's influenced subsequent generations is really his uh, belief in free minds and open minds and uh, continuing to uh, evolve uh, throughout his lifetime, not becoming uh, fossilized. And this quote uh, you may know comes from his uh, tombstone at the Texas State Cemetery in Austin. So, um, 
everybody here has heard of J. Frank Doby, I'm sure, right? Um, you know, I've talked to uh, students. I've been all across Texas and a few other places talking about Doby. And uh, most people younger than we are here, um, if they've heard of Doby, it's only vaguely through things that are named after him. So there's um, a real kind of loss of, of him as a person. And I'm going to talk a bit about kind of that tragic process and how that came about. But in the meantime, you can see uh, his kind of lasting legacy here. You know, you have the high school in Pasadena. There's a middle school in Austin named for Doby, uh, elementary school in Dallas area, and a middle school in suburban San Antonio. And of course, in Austin, we have the Doby Mall, Doby Theater, and then that 26-story mirrored high-rise Doby Tower. And if you know anything about J. Frank Doby, you know he would have hated that damn tower. <laughs> and then we have this. Have you guys seen this before? You know where that is, right? Mm -hmm. You know where the statue is? Art Springs in Austin, that's right. And that's uh, Doby in the middle with Roy Betachek on the left and Walter Prescott Whale on the right. Um, <laughs> Doby and Betachek hung out a lot at Barton Springs. Uh, Walter Prescott Webb is not really a swimmer, but he would sort of come down and dip his toe in the talk from time to time. And this, as Mary Margaret mentioned, is uh, the Doby House in Austin. Uh, this very nearly was torn down to make room for a 7-Eleven. We all need another 7-Eleven in our world. Um, and it was Doby's family, uh, led by Dudley and Saved the Doby, uh, who stepped in, saved the house, um, got it registered as a National Historic Landmark, and now it's been turned over to um, UT Austin. And um, one of the other people that Doby influenced during his life was the author James Michener. Michener had written his first book. Um, it was a little like getting again, I was a little unsure about whether his book was any good. And one day he opened up his mail and he had a letter from J. Frank Doby telling him, basically, you know, I believe in you. You're a terrific writer. You have a great career ahead of you. Mr. never forgot about that. So when he had a chance, they gave UT Austin $14 million for the writing program and to turn this house into the um, kind of the spiritual center of that writing program. And here we have Doby's Ranch outside of Austin, Paisano, that Mary Margaret also mentioned, uh, 254 acres. I was out there a couple of weeks ago, and um, this place um, has, uh, is another way that Doby's really has a lasting influence on our culture in Texas. There is a literary fellowship, one of the most coveted in the country. And it goes to writers who have Texas connections. And generally, two writers a year uh, take turns spending a few months each at the ranch where they're uh, allowed to work on you know, sort of beautiful land and uh, relative tranquility. Um, and of course, the way Austin's growing now, you know, the entire Paisano is ringed by giant big mansions that kind of look down on the ranch. But um, and I think UT is actually. Uh, there's a kind of a battle going on at UT right now, too. Um, you know, there's so much work done to preserve this property, to turn into this uh, place for literary production. And I think UT sees it kind of as a piece of real estate at this point. So this, this may be something that we'll all be hearing about more and more as time goes on. But, you know, when Doby came around, there was really no such thing as Texas literature. He basically invented Texas literature and Texas writing. Uh, he gave Texas writers a voice by being the first to speak, and through his Paisano program that, that allows these other authors to come forth, it's done the same thing for so many other of our most important Texas writers, really. You think about people like Steve Harrington, who wrote Gates of the Alamo. Remember Ben Clayton, his excellent novel that came out a couple of years ago? He was a Dobie Paisano film. Um, Sandra Cisneros, is anybody here familiar with Sandra Cisneros? leading Mexican-American woman writer in the country. Um, she said that it was the Doby Paisano grant that kept her from marching out of Texas, that kept her rooted in Texas, where she's produced some of her best work. And the list goes on and on and on. So this is a real, uh, to me, uh, another important part of Doby's cultural legacy. Now, recognize everybody in this photo, I hope. Got Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, 
and Frank Dopey. This is um, early 1964, a few months before Dopey died. He died in September 64, I believe. And um, LBJ wanted to invite Frank to the White House, and Dobie declined, citing his poor health. So LBJ, um, I should tell you that LBJ, well, Richard Nixon did not invent the idea of uh, taping phone conversations in the White House, uh, or taping any conversations. Uh, he got that idea from Lyndon Johnson, who had his own uh, recording equipment set up. So you can hear some of these tapes. And um, LBJ called Dobie, he did not record that one, but he did record a later call um, where he spoke to a journalist, Marshall McNeil. Here's what LBJ said. I called old man Dobie this morning and told him I'd send Lady Bird's plane and bring him to Dallas and I'd buy his tickets and I'd get him up here and he'd stay at the White House and God damn it, he'd have to come up and do it. Johnson added, he said he didn't know whether he'd make it because Dobie's health was failing. He said, I'm like a horse that's down in his bottom. So, Lyndon, of course, is a very persuasive man, and uh, he got Dobie up, and then he placed this one called Jerry Truman, and I'm hoping uh, we can hear. Let's see how this goes. These two iPhone applications are hard to deal with. Okay, I have it. There we go. Okay.
contributions to a real negative perception of Frank Dobie. Um, the person on the left, anybody know who that is? He's wearing a shirt that says Minor Regional Novelist, and that is a young Larry McMurtry. And it was um, McMurtry who, uh, just four years after Dobie's death, published kind of a mocking essay called Southwestern Literature with a question mark. And um, this was collected in his book of essays, um, In the Narrow Grave. Has anybody seen that book or have it? Um, that book was published by my friend Bill Whitliffe. Bill is the founding, uh, the person who founded the Whitliffe Collections where I work uh, in San Marcos at the university. And um, Bill actually founded the collection with the gift of Dobie papers. That's a whole other story. But um, Bill's uh, Encino Press was on publishing this book. And Bill Whitliffe was a huge fan of, of J. Frank Dobie um, because Bill had the same epiphany, and I've talked to so many writers, and, and Taylor's mentioned this too, who had this same realization in their life. Um, Bill, uh, like a lot of creative people, you know, Bill would have, uh, let's see, what has he done? He's a photographer, a screenwriter, he's, um, he's produced and I did the screenplay for Lonesome Dove, for example, a number of other films. Um, Bill grew up uh, outside of Blanco, uh, and he would go down to the courthouse lawn and hear all the old timers uh, tell their stories, you know, uh, sitting there. And these were great stories, and Bill loved them. But whenever he would go check a book out of the library, of course, the books were always set, you know, in, in New England um, or in England, you know, someplace where people were civilized. And when Bill was about 11 years old, an aunt gave him um, a copy of uh, a book, uh, I'll Tell You a Tale. And he opened up the book and started reading it. And he saw in that book the same story that he heard around Courthouse Square in print, written by J. Frank Dobie. And at that moment, that's when Bill realized you can make art from the place you live, even if it's Texas. And Dobie gave him this inspiration to become a writer and artist himself. Um, so Bill was very loyal to J. Frank Dobie. Um, he received his manuscript from his friend Larry McMurtry attacking Dobie. And McMurtry basically wrote, um, well, he said a lot of terrible things, but his basic argument was that Dobie was a terrible writer and no one should ever pay any attention to this man again. Um, and Bertha Dobie, Dobie's widow, was still alive at the time. And so Bill Whitliffe went down to visit Bertha, who's living in Austin, and said, you know, I have this manuscript by this young writer, McMurtry, who's kind of attacking your husband, and I'm not sure really about my feelings about publishing this. And Bertha told Bill Whitliffe, Frank would have wanted you to publish that. Frank believed in open criticism and honest discussions of things. Frank would have said, publish it. So Bill did. The book came out. Uh, a couple of days later, there was a knock at his door, and there was Bertha Dopey at the door, and she was holding a copy of McMurtry's book, and she was shaking it at Bill Whitliffe, and she said, you should not have published this book. <laughs> That will give you an idea, I hope, of uh, kind of how harsh and virtue was. And clearly what he's trying to do psychologically is the great old man in Texas Letters had died. McMurtry saw himself as natural heir, so he was in clear space for himself to occupy center stage there. Um, the person in the middle, do you know who that is? No. Uh, good guess, so. Exactly. This is uh, Catherine Ann Porter. She and Dobie were basically the same age. And um, she followed the trail of a lot of artists and writers from Texas. That is, she got the hell out of the state as soon as she could to find her way, to find her vision. She felt constricted of uh, being here. And um, she and Dobie were sort of professionally cool to each other, but there was a great outrage perpetrated upon Catherine Porter in 1939 that um, her admirers had never forgotten. And let's make no mistake that Catherine Porter has um, a national and international literary following still today. Um, but what happened is uh, Adobe's book, Apache Gold and Yaki Silver, was a finalist for uh, the Best Book of the Year prize given by the Texas Institute of Letters. The other finalist was Catherine Porter's book, um, Pale Horse, Pale Rider. Has anybody ever seen that book or read it? Um, it's got an excellent story there about the Spanish influence. It's a really fine book. Um, guess who the poets went to? They went to Frank Dobie. 
And I will say, at the time Doe died, we began to see the, the arising of the, the feminist movement and women scholars coming to the forefront. And they looked at J. Frank Doby's work, and they looked at Catherine Porter, who had been robbed of her deserved prize by this man. And so the attacks on Doby came not just from younger writers, but also from the women writers who were attacking J. Frank Doby as a misogynist. And on the right, exactly, this is a miracle, but that is. Um, the man who basically single-handedly invented Chicano literature. Um, Paredes, as a young man, wrote a terrific novel called um, George Washington Gomez. He wrote it in the 1930s. And he wrote that at the time where Dewey was at his most blowhardy, I guess you would say. He would go around making these grand pronouncements about how wonderful Texas was. Um, and so Paredes sort of savagely satirized Dewey in this novel. Um, the book was not published for 50 years. <laughs> uh, Panettis, uh, he's, he lived in Brownsville at the time. And he said that whenever he, you know, whenever he would send mail from Brownsville to Austin, it would always take basically a week to get to Austin. But whenever he sent his manuscript, it was always returned the next day. <laughs> so, you know, really hard time with it. But in the meantime, Panettis, uh basically launched the Chicago Literature Movement by writing this uh, amazing book called With His Pistol in His Hand that basically takes on the Texas Ranger mythology and presents the other side of the story. And um, this was published in 1958. Uh, it was a pretty brave thing for a young Mexican-American academic uh, to do at that time. But it was, I think, it was certainly like with pistol whipping and so forth. Um, one of the things he says in that book is, uh, he sort of makes fun of the ranger's propensity to tell stories about themselves and sort of glorify themselves. And Panetta said, if you take all of the books published by the Texas Rangers about their accounts, and you put them all into a pile, one on top of the other, the resulting pile will be nearly as tall as some of the stories they tell. So. And so when Panetta became a hero, to young Mexican-American scholars who were coming of age in the 80s and the 90s. And his book finally was published. Great claim is considered a Texas classic. And I'm talking about his novel where he satirizes Dobie. is considered a Texas classic. Um, and even Don Graham, who Mary and Margaret mentioned, was cool to the novel. They felt it, um, it was too angry. It's come around now and is included in his list of Texas classics and even teaches it. Um, this helped also seal Frank's reputation. So, what do we got? Terrible writer, misogynist, and the racist, J. Frank Doby, all wrapped up together. And I'm telling you this because when I was in graduate school, this is what I heard about Doby. These are the lessons that we were being taught. If you learned about the Southwestern literature, Southwestern studies, this was the portrait of Pancho that we got. Here he is at the Centennial, and this picture kind of uh, is emblematic of, of the blue card Doby. Um, so a strange thing happened for me personally. When I was working at the Widow Collections um, and looking at these incredible archives we have for writers, and I'm just going to tell you, there are a lot of stories I can tell you about archives. I'll just tell you one really quickly. Everybody is familiar with Cormac McCarthy, right? The great, uh, you know, the lone wolf writer of American literature who is so principled he never gives interviews unless it's to Oprah, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And Cormac has let it be said that he was such a literary rebel, he never had an agent his entire career, you know, up until the 90s or whatever, when somebody needed to count his millions of dollars. Um, and that he just made his way through the publishing industry based on his merit as a writer and his unprincipled, uncompromising stance. Um, so we got Cormac's uh, archive at the Woodlife Collections. And you know what? When you look in those papers, the first thing you see is that Cormac did have a literary agent his entire career. And further, she was the best damn literary agent in the business. It was Candy Donadio. She also represented uh, Thomas Pynchon, Joseph Heller, Philip Roth, and Cormac McCarthy. So he was lying, which brings up another kind of Kelton quote, which is uh, fiction writers are liars and thieves. And it's um, the archives where you get the truth. So, to get back to Doby, for me, um, digging into Doby's papers, I saw a vastly different person than the one that had been presented to me. 
And that's why I wanted to start telling the story of who Doty was, who Big Doty was. Um, there had not been a biography of Doty for many, many years. This was the last one uh, by Lon Tinkle. And um, yeah, the tone of the illustration. The public image we all had of Doty uh, was always an old man with gray hair and black and white photos. You know, what college students can be interested in hearing about somebody like that. And what I wanted to do was to go back and find out who Doty really was and to present him as he was in his time, in color, before his hair turned even. Um, this is an amazing painting of Doty done at the height of his powers by Alexander Hogue. And Jim, I should mention that Hoag's also done a painting of Sheffield, Texas. It's pretty terrific. We talked about Sheffield earlier. Hoag's one of the great uh, artists of, of, the, of the regionalist movement in the 1930s and 40s. And as, as Mary Margaret said, you know, um, what Doby did is something that we're still really sorting out with uh, in uh, academia because folklore is still kind of a stepchild in many ways. But folklore was the original social history. And Dobie's had a number of great, really brilliant insights during his career, during his work. One was he consciously rejected the great man theory of history in favor for folk history. And if you know anything about academia, you know in the 1960s we saw that broad movement of social history suddenly becoming acceptable. Dobie was far, far ahead of his time. But even more important than that, um, I'll be honest, you know, reading and writing came late to Texas. Uh, we did not have a well-developed literary culture. But Texas has great storytellers. We have an incredible folkloric legacy among African Americans, Mexican Americans, Anglo Americans, basically from the 19th century. And as Dobie was coming of age in the early 20th century, well, you know what was happening. All those people were dying out, right? We were embracing industrialization, mass conformity, standardization. Radio was coming along. And those stories were being lost. And so what Doe's greatest value is, probably, is that he went and rescued those stories before they died forever. And basically rescued a huge swath of our social history in Texas. And the historians that I mentioned, um, I think, are still generally pretty late to recognize this still, because historians focus on conflict. Bloody conflict makes for much more exciting history for many historians. And I think what Dobie wanted to talk about was how people relate to each other rather than fight each other. So it's um, still kind of uh, being worked out. So really, where you see Dobie's main influence now is um, from other writers who will go in and what did Elmer say to fiction writers are liars and thieves? They're thieves, they steal stuff from Dobie all the time. Actually, um, next week I'll be presenting at the Western Literature Association about how Cormac McCarthy lifted nearly word for word some passages from an article that Dobie wrote uh, and used it in one of his novels. It's very fascinating. And you know, McCarthy used uh, great sections of his novel, The Crossing, which the only source for that material that he got was from J. Frank Doby directly, almost a direct transference. So Doby's um, literal influence is, is still lasting, even if it's not always, you know, Cormac doesn't give interviews where he says, oh, it was Frank Doby who you know, gave me this idea. But even if his name's not out there, the influence you certainly see. So here's Doby. Um, you know, he had the great foresight to publish a book about buried treasures right when the Depression hit, and, and that certainly helped Stills a lot. And what happened for him as a Texas writer then, you know, I said earlier, he invented Texas literature. Of course, Texas was withstanding really the worst of the Depression because of our oil boom. And Texas was rapidly transitioning from kind of a poor, backwards agricultural state into kind of a wealthy, swaggering, petrochemical state. And we were gaining great political power, but we didn't really have much cultural cachet. And Doby is a best-selling author here, gave us that right around the time of the centennial. So he became a big folk, a folk hero for many people in Texas. Uh, if you ask people in Texas that a writer they'd ever heard of, they could name one, and that was J. Frank Doby. 
So he went on to publish many books, as you all know. He was so well known that uh, there's a painting of him on the cover of The Atlantic in 1952. He was publishing in Harper's Magazine. Uh, he published, I think, 800 magazine articles in his lifetime, uh, over 1,300 uh, newspaper columns. So he was a big celebrity. But it wasn't just Toby's writing, of course, that made him a celebrity. Um, this pamphlet that we have in our archive here, I don't know if you can read it, but down at the bottom it says, J. Frank Doby, not at all a normal man. And that's a pretty apt description of Doby. And this is Doby's wife, Bertha. And, um, you know, I describe her in the book as Dobie's long-suffering wife. She was often left alone while Frank would set out on his adventures. And she had uh, once observed with her husband. Here's what she said about him. I should say that in Frank, pig, charging bull, and mule together make a half. And the other half is humanity at its very finest. And that's a pretty accurate description, probably. So when we're talking about Dobie not being a normal man, you all are familiar with this book, I'm sure. It's still a standard bibliographic reference to life and literature of the Southwest. You're exactly right. You're way ahead of me right here. If you can see that, not copyright in 1942. Again, not copyright in 1952. Anybody is welcome to help himself to any of it in any way. And that's the spirit of Dobie. So, as I mentioned, Dobie was a celebrity. He had a big stage in Texas. He had a weekly newspaper column that went to most, reached most media markets in the state. His guiding philosophy was basically Texas needs brains. Um, <laughs> perhaps more true now than ever. Uh, but that was really the fight that he was fighting. And um, so, in his newspaper columns, uh, he would sort of, you know, air his views and um, catch a lot of flack for his political views, of course. I think it was Ted Dealey in the Dallas Morning News who told him, Frank, I like it when you write about history, but I don't like it when you write about politics. And they just wouldn't run those columns. They would just cut them off. And I told you earlier about those views of Dobie as a racist and misogynist and so forth. So I want to come around and, and tell you a couple of these stories. Um, on the left is Jovita Gonzalez. When I go out to Western Literature next week, there are going to be two people presenting, presenting on her. You know, she's from Corpus Christi. Um, she was a student of Dobie's in the 1920s, and he uh, and Bertha basically saw how bright Jovita was, and they both mentored her. And it was through Dobie's influence that Jovita um, got elected into the uh, Texas Folklore Society in the 1920s. By 1929, I think it was, maybe 1930, Jovita uh, Gonzalez was the president of the Texas Folklore Society. And so if you think about the standing of, of women and Mexican Americans at that time, the fact that this woman was the head of the organization in 1930 is pretty remarkable. And Jovita, you know, was, with Dobie's encouragement, was publishing all kinds of Mexican American folklore. Uh, he helped her get a Rockefeller grant to write a novel. She was going great guns, and people expected her to be really the next big thing from Texas. And then she just disappeared, basically dropped off the map. Do you know what happened to her? She got married. It was her husband, E. e. Morales, who shut her down and wouldn't let her do anything. Uh, this is actually Thomas and the other women writers from Africa, too. So what I would ask is, was Dobie the misogynist? And uh, there was a Hobita's husband. And there were many other women writers from that era who also uh, were greatly supported by Frank Dobie. He basically supported other writers, uh, particularly good writers, and gave them all kinds of encouragement. Um, the happy thing about Hobita is that her work has been rediscovered in recent years. And so she has four books in print right now. Um, and uh, 
is the object of a lot of scholarly attention. On the right is another folk horse, Jamie St. Brewer. Um, it was in the mid-1930s when Doby brought Brewer into the Texas Folk Horse Society, thus into fully integrating the organization. And when I talk to the students and you say 1930s, you know, as far as they're concerned, that's biblical time. So I'll say, you know, that's 30 years before Martin Luther King. And they go, oh, wow. Um, so yeah, Doby helped um, Brewer's career, helped him get his first book published by UT Press. Um, they integrated the Driscoll Hotel in Austin to have a book release party for Brewer. Doby wrote the introduction for it, and Brewer went on to have a great career in folklore, a um, major American folklorist. So um, Doby's life story is pretty interesting because he was basically a 19th century libertarian for the first half of his life. And, and even as a libertarian, that's why he was opening doors for people like Jovita Gonzalez or J. Mason Brewer, because he didn't believe in any constraints on freedom. And then he underwent this kind of profound transformation through the help of his friend Roy Bedicek, uh, who was kind of an early hippie in Texas. Uh, it was 1907 when Bedicek rode his bicycle across the state. And um, Bedicek published his first book, I think he was 69 years old when it came out, Adventures with the Texas Naturalist. It was Bedicek who uh, really kind of influenced Dewey to sort of embrace these uh, progressive political views that brought, brought Dewey into such great conflict with his old buddies. Um, so Dewey came out fighting as a political liberal. This is around World War II. Um, and he wanted to write about his times, but he realized, as he wrote to Roy Bedicek, uh, he's too damn ignorant, really, of the present because he's so dead most of his life writing about the coyotes in the open range. Uh, so what Doby did is he started sneaking his newfound political philosophy into his books. So if you read particularly his later animal books, you'll see all kinds of uh, interesting statements. Uh, as far as coyotes go, uh, Doby would say things like, you know, they, they demonstrate altruistic behavior. They're not simply the thing and call stereotypes that have been overemphasized by a society devoted to propagating the philosophy of greed under the guise of free enterprise. So he's kind of raising hell there. Um, wait, I'm going to go back because I'm probably going on too long, but um, <laughs> um, I want to read to you what uh, Martin Shockley said uh, in introducing J. Frank Doby at uh, an event. Shockley said that it, um, I came to Texas with about average ignorance and prejudice. I'd always consider the coyote a pesky varmint, a cunning chicken thief, a sneaky villain best seen over the side of a 30-30. And then I read a book by J. Frank Doby and learned that the coyote is a noble creature with a proud and independent spirit and a fierce love of freedom. I'd always consider the longhorn a stupid cow critter, all bone, gristle, and stringy meat, mean, vicious, and hard to handle. Then I read a book by J. Frank Doby and learned that the Longhorn is a noble creature with a proud and independent spirit and a fierce love of freedom. I had always considered the Mustang the sorriest specimen of horse flesh, hammerhead and long legged, you next, way back, bushy tailed, ornery, and dangerous. Then I read a book by J. Frank Doby and learned that the Mustang is a noble creature with a proud and independent spirit and a fierce love of freedom. Now they'll tell me Mr. Doby is writing about rattlesnakes, and I anticipate an agonizing reappraisal. <laughs> so Doby is kind of uh, coming out as a political, liberal, humanist sort, making some enemies, and there are some terrible breaks with old friends, um, like the man in the middle, J. Evans Haley, who was like a son to Doby for many years. Um, you know, Haley was the one. <laughs> who, uh, he became really kind of one of the early John Birch leaders in, in Texas at the time. And he's the one who, uh, after the Brown v. Board decision, which of course, you know, Doby supported wholeheartedly, um, Haley told the National Indignation Convention that, um, well, he was, he was following another speaker, he said, the, the speaker before me, he said, he's turned moderate because all he wants to do is impeach Chief Justice Earl Warren, whereas I'm all for hanging so these are the kind of people that Doby was up against. And um, 
it's really quite tragic what happened in the friendship. But, you know, Haley led um, a campaign for uh, censoring school textbooks. He formed an organization called Texans for America in the early 1960s. Um, and the idea of St. Valentine's we have today really was to um, adjust the textbooks so they don't play up, um, as Haley put it, Negro communists. Um, so his organization opposed textbooks having any favorable mention of the income tax, social security, uh, United Nations, farm subsidies, the Marshall Plan, uh, UNESCO, and of course integration. And Haley's uh, organization, Textbooks for America, also demanded that uh, there be a blacklist for people whose loyalty to America was in question. Their names be stricken from these books. So those names included, you know, the, the usual radicals you would imagine: Albert Einstein, uh, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, Willa Cather, Langston Hughes, Carl Sandburg and of course, J. Frank Doty. So there was a moment where Haley and Doty had a kind of dramatic showdown at the state capitol. Um, a couple of years before Doty died, that was where he sort of roused himself for one big battle. Um, and of course, that's Tapio Daniel on the left, Team Doty, we're always at each other's throats. And on the right, you know who that guy is. So, when McCarthyism is sweeping the country, who's the one person in Texas who stood up to McCarthy? I mean, people were standing up, but who had a public um, soapbox where he could stand up and say, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this. That's what Billy was doing in his column. So he was really a man of courage and principles, and um, you know, it was inspiring, not just writers, but inspiring free-thinking people then, uh, as he does today. So this is uh, just kind of more of what Billy was doing. <laughs> Uh, he was advocating the right of labor to strike during World War II. He was uh, writing on integration for uh, African American journals and so forth. Uh, just basically raising hell. When Doby was a conservative, he loved to raise hell from the right. When he was a liberal, he loved to raise hell from the left. That's just kind of who he was. Um, and what was fascinating to me in researching Doby was finding out uh, not only did Lyndon Johnson, of course, award him the, the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor, um, J. Edgar Hooker was uh, ordering that Doty be investigated as a possible communist subversive. His loyalty to America was in question. So I got a big fat envelope of J. Frank Doty investigation files from the FBI when I wrote off for the Freedom of Information Act request. And uh, those things are really eye opening. Um, I'll tell you what. Um, you know, a lot of rear burning window, but uh, they would sort of interview Doty's colleagues at the school, and people would say things like, well, I disagree with the man totally. He's a blowhard. He's a terrible teacher. His wife teaches most of his classes anyway. I don't like a thing about him, but he's probably still a good American. So that guy ended up dropping his investigation. You know what? I think this photo is uh, actually in Beeville. This is how it's still standing. Yeah. Um, so for me, what, what I came to really love and appreciate and cherish about uh, Frank Doby is that he grew up in a time of great prejudice. Um, and, you know, I think he had the art, the art and the literature in his soul, but he had the South Texas brush country in his bones. And growing up in the brush country gave him a, a real devotion to, well, you know, he was born at the end of the great cattle drive, so he had a real devotion to the open range. And it was that idea of the open range and not being fenced in that I think really led his mind to where it could go wherever it wanted to go. So his belief in free thinking and no boundaries, no blinders, fortified by lots and lots of books, um, is kind of what helped uh, create a great man. So that's basically it. Thanks so much for staying awake and paying attention. things to tell us. I've said it again about Frank Dewey. Uh, we appreciate uh, Ms. Campbell and Mr. Davis coming out very much. I hope you all enjoyed this and hopefully we will have more of these in the future. So stay tuned to the college's website and that should keep you updated as to future lecture series.
Uh, thank you again. Please help yourself to the refreshments that are still left outside. Uh, I don't want to have to take them all home. So uh, again, thank you, Mr. Davis and Ms. Campbell. We appreciate it very much.